begin talking about the anatomy of the kidney, we're going to follow the blood supply in. On the left side here, we have a blown up version of the kidney itself, and we can see the renal artery coming in and splitting into five segmental arteries, the renal vein draining roughly the same area and heading out that way. And you'll notice the kidney has a little bit of a curve inward to follow those vessels. In real life, this will be packed with some fat and sometimes appears to be inside the kidney, but it's technically still outside and is called the renal sinus. Now the renal capsule is the structure on the surface that separates the kidney from the rest of the external environment. Just underneath the capsule we have the paler cortex here. And then we have the darker renal medulla here. And you'll notice that the renal medulla is often kind of grouped into these lobules which we call renal pyramids. And because we have these renal pyramids here, we sometimes have areas of the cortex that actually move down amid them, and these are going to be called renal columns. So renal columns are part of the cortex, renal pyramids are part of the medulla, and the nephron is going to be the functional structure of the kidney that takes the blood and then actually filters it into urine, recovers some of the fluid and some of the ions that are traveling through it, and then releases it as urine to go down the ureter. If we look over here, we can see that we've got a blown up model of the first part of the nephron. The nephron technically is both the blood vessel and collection apparatus that allows the blood to become filtered, create urine, which is then released. Here in this first part, we have the glomerulus. This is going to be this big tangle of blood vessels. We have an afferent arterial coming in. We have this wrapping around of the vessel here leading to an efferent arterial. No oxygen exchange has take, taken place, so these are both still arterial in nature. We have an outside lining here called the external part of Bowman's capsule, and we also have what are called podocytes on the surface of these vessels that are allowing the filtration of blood to come through and the fluid to leave and go into this area, Bowman's, or the renal space, and then here we start trailing down the tubules that will then carry the urine. Now over on this model we can see a little bit of the convoluted, straight, thin, thick, convoluted again tubules that are leading to the collecting duct. Now most of this is going to involve the histology and physiology of the kidney, so the anatomy really is not any more complicated than that. What you need to know is that along the way the fluid and ions, sugars and other items that are in the blood can be recovered and put back into the bloodstream through vessels that are running nearby, but the urine itself is released through these collecting ducts, and when it's released it goes to what are called papillae, these tips at the end of each renal pyramid. And from the papillae it's going to travel into this collecting area called a minor calyx, so right here we can see a minor calyx opened up on this side. Another one right here, renal papilla releasing urine into those spaces. And minor calyces meet at major calyces. So here's a major calyx. Here's another one right here. And the major calyces all come together into this expanded collection area called the renal pelvis. I don't care for the fact it's called the pelvis because we have a bony pelvis already, but that is the name. and the renal pelvis is going to narrow and narrow and narrow to become the proximal part of the ureter. Now we have another model showing the kidneys in relationship to their blood supply as well as the drainage of urine that's going to reach the urinary bladder. So just to note, once again we have the aorta here giving off a left and right renal artery. Blood from the kidney then gets returned through the right and left renal veins to the inferior vena cava. When last we were looking at the kidney, we saw how the minor calyces combined to form major calyces went to become the renal pelvis and then the proximal ureter. The ureter is basically this muscular tube taking urine down from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. And the want to note, this little bump right here, that's not actually the ureter, that's the ductus deferens or vas deferens in the male. If we flip this here, we can actually see that the ureter is doing what it should do, going into the posterior side of the urinary bladder. 
Now the anatomy of the ureter is not that sophisticated. It's a cool organ, but there's not much to say about it anatomically. But one thing I do want you to note is that in the abdomen, it gets its blood supply from things that are um, from vessels that are located medial to it. But in the pelvis, it gets its blood supply from vessels that are located lateral to it. And you never want to push the abdominal ureter laterally and stretch and possibly disrupt those vessels. And in the pelvis, you never want to push it medially, again, stretching and disrupting those vessels that might be coming into it from its lateral side. We get to the urinary bladder itself. We'll zoom in here a little bit. And the bladder, basically, is made up of a muscle and it is called the detrusor muscle. It's a large, smooth muscle structure. We have the ureters entering its posterior side, and here the posterior ureteric openings are present on the right and on the left. And from there we have a little crest connecting them across the top called the interureteric crest, and at the bottom we have the neck of the bladder narrowing down to become the internal urethral orifice. Now, if we take the internal urethral orifice and the two ureteric openings, they're connected by a smooth area, and that's called the trigon of the bladder, and it's an important landmark when you're trying to locate any of these openings during a procedure. And from there, urine is going to leave the bladder through the urethra. Now, in males, this is going to be a fairly elongated process as we pass through the prostatic urethra, then a muscular membranous urethra, then the penile or spongy urethra. Now because we have a prostate on this model, this is clearly demonstrating a male variation on that, but in women we have an elongated membranous urethra surrounded by a uh, skeletal muscle sphincter, and that's just going to be the membranous urethra which then opens into the vestibule and voids urine in that way.